Hello listeners, this is Kat and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This is the continuation of Swallow the Stars. This will be part 23, chapter 23, entitled Window Shopping. The countdown to the end of term passes at a snail's pace. With both Izuku and Hitoshi officially accepted into UA, Hitoshi's letter had come in the middle of the week two weeks ago, and he had opened it with Izuku during lunch at school. All that's left is to prepare for their final exams and add more complex attacks to their training menus including lessons from Aizawa on how to fight with knives. Per Izuku's insistence, he has hardly trained with Amahaki since the recommendation exam, wanting to focus more on what he can do quirkless now that he's proven his power to the UA board of directors. Hitoshi's training, on the other hand, has focused more on his quirk and less on his weapons. Izuku likes being his test subject, but sometimes Aizawa or Hizashi will take his place so that Izuku can write up notes on how Hitoshi can improve. It's now the weekend before finals, and the warming air of late March mixed with the lazy tune of a Sunday afternoon is really making Izuku yearn for a less strict sleep schedule and days spent outside of a classroom. So he leaves Aizawa at home to parse through some last-minute grading, which will likely devolve into a late afternoon nap on the couch with Coco and Leo, in favor of going shopping by himself. He checks an invitation for Hitoshi to come along. But he has been mandated to family time today, and can't find room to escape, which realistically is just fine, because it means that Izuku can look for birthday gifts for all three of his favorite people and not have to worry about spoiling surprises. But finding a place that sells something that he likes, on top of being within his price range, as cheap as possible, is far more of a challenge than he thought it would be. Granted, it might help if he actually had an idea of what he should be looking for. Usually he goes into birthdays with a plan, but he hasn't had time to think of anything yet. Today, he's hoping to at least come up with an idea, even if he can't find a specific item that he wants. With a quiet sigh, Izuku pushes his way into a small shop set up on the edge of the side street. He sweeps the interior with his eyes as he steps out of the sun in warming spring air, glad for the lack of people. He's gotten much better about being in crowds. School has helped a lot, though he can't dismiss the second-year UA students who used to bring him to lunch either, but having breathing room is always nice. He's standing in an open area at the front of the shop, with the counter to his left and aisles full of items to his right. Izuku waves at the older man behind the counter as he gets his bearings. When the man gives him a nod and greeting, Izuku turns his attention elsewhere, looking up at the seam between the wall and the ceiling to note the lack of security cameras there and elsewhere around the shop. Not great, but also not unexpected. They're so far off the beaten path that he doubts there's much foot traffic through here. A middle-aged woman walks out from the back room, a small apron, marking her as an employee, and carries a box into the aisles. Izuku bounces his attention from her to a man with violently pink hair, and the two young girls at his side that he assumes to be his daughters. They have that same pink hair, so maybe it's part of their quirk, though it could just be genetic because Izuku has green-tinted hair, and he's quirkless, so that's obviously genetic, but if it is part of their quirk, then maybe he could... No, not today. He gives himself a mental shake and loops his eyes around the store again to take in the only other customer, a lone man with blonde hair in a slouch walking slowly up one of the aisles. Humming to himself, Izuku begins to work his way through the store. There are a lot of items to parse through, small knickknacks and larger keepsakes, but Izuku thinks that a gift for Hizashi, Aizawa, or Hitoshi has to be able to jump out at him, even amongst the clutter, so he doesn't mind taking his time. Every now and then, he even spies something that might work, but when he checks the price, he just winces and puts it back. On one shelf, he sees a happy little plaque about first loves, and he blushes as he remembers Hitoshi bringing his acceptance letter to school and opening it, over lunch with Izuku. Remembers Hitoshi's shock at having made the top ten applicants. Remembers kissing Hitoshi harder than they had before. Arms wrapped around his neck and excitement, practically making him crawl into Hitoshi's lap. Remembers Hitoshi holding him so gently, but kissing him back so eagerly. They're going to UA together. They're even going to be in the same class. Still blushing, Izuku shakes his head to get out of the memory as he continues to browse the aisles. The shop may be mostly empty, but he doesn't need to be caught unaware in public. He's thinking about moving to a different store. Maybe one on a busier road so that the prices aren't inflated to make up for a lack of foot traffic. When the door bursts open with too much vigor and then slams shut, Izuku hears the lock click into place from where he is three aisles down and he ducks quickly to avoid being seen. Everyone up front! A male voice demands, too loud, too aggravated, nervous, serious, flighty. Now! Izuku stays firmly where he is, heart pounding in his chest. If this is a villain, and it has to be, right? Then Izuku wants to keep even a slight advantage. Aizawa will kill him if he does something stupid, so he's going to refrain from getting involved for as long as possible, even though Amahaki feels positively electric as it rises under his skin. He wants to think that he can get out of this without getting involved at all. 
but the locked door and the general agitation from whoever just walked in is telling him otherwise. He is probably going to do something stupid. He shouldn't. He really should just stay where he is and let this play out while he's safe. But if something happens to anyone else and he could have stopped it, he'll never forgive himself. From where he's crouched down, Izuku watches all the people from earlier fall past at the front end of the aisle he's crouched behind. No one looks at him. He doubts that anyone other than the old man behind the counter even noticed him come inside. Never in his life had he been more happy to be a short, plain-looking kid. Get out from behind the counter, the villain shouts, and for a fraction of a second Izuku fears he's been found out. But when he swings his head around, there's no one near him, so the villain must be talking to the old man. He doesn't ask for money, though, which is concerning. It means that what he wants isn't cash, and Izuku doesn't know how to defuse that. Money would be easy. He could just take it and leave. This, whatever this is, is worse. All right, everyone sit down, backs against the counter, except you. There's a shout, then a short scream that has to come from one of the pink-haired girls as a good spotted with her father. Please don't. Let her go, please. Shut up. Shut up. The villain hisses, audible over the girls crying, but just barely. She's loud. Not that Izuku blames her for being upset, but it does make it more difficult for Izuku to keep track of the situation through hearing alone. Blowing out a slow, silent breath, Izuku gets on his hands and knees and crawls forward. He needs to see what's happening, at the very least. He doesn't want to get involved, but he can't help at all if he's in the back of the store. Okay, so maybe he does want to get involved, now that there's someone in immediate danger of being hurt. There's no way he isn't going to do whatever he can to defuse the situation. He's far enough back into the shop, several aisles away from the door, that he should be able to peek around the end of the aisle without getting spotted. It sounds like the villain is still near the door. It hasn't stepped further inside, but even that is really only going to be in his favor if the villain is turned away. Izuku decides to just bite the metaphorical bullet and look. The villain is, in fact, still near the door, about in line with the register, but equidistant from the counter and the front of the first aisle. He's not particularly tall, and his quirk is clearly a mutant type, given the bat-like wings sprouting from his back and the beak-like appearance of his face. He's muscular, but his broad shoulders could easily be his downfall if Izuku plays his cards right. No. No, he shouldn't be doing anything. He should wait for the police and the pro-heroes to show up. He should just stay hunkered down where he's safe and hidden, and let help arrive on its own. But the villain has a fucking gun in one hand, and a loose fist in the little girl's bright pink hair, and he is yanking her around as he paces in agitation. Izuku can't step away from this, not without at least trying to help. He doesn't have to fight, he just has to help. He has to try to save that little girl, at least. Give me the landline. The villain says, pointing the gun at the old shop worker, who scrambles to his feet and walks back around the corner to grab the phone. Thankfully, the cord is long enough to set it on the counter, and then he quickly retakes his seat on the floor while the villain calls the police. Izuka tunes out the one-sided conversation for a moment and sweeps his eyes over the other civilians. They're hostages now, he reminds himself, and technically he is too. He takes note of their varying stages of reaction. The pink-haired father is crying quietly and clutching his other daughter who's trembling in his arms but not making a sound. The woman in the apron, who had come out of the back room earlier, looks like she's already in shock, eyes unfocused as she sits absolutely still. The blonde man with the hunch had kept darting his eyes around the store to the villain and then away, but thankfully never seems to see Izuku. Stay there, old man, Izuku thinks, touching his fingertips against his thumbs to keep himself steady. Amahaki swirls and cinches around his spine, tight and cold and painful, and Izuku has to fight down a hiss. No, shut up. The villain's harsh voice had startled Izuku's eyes back to him. Listen to me. I have hostages. You come in here, they die. I'm going to take a kid out with me, and you're going to let me go. And then maybe, if you fucking listen to me, the kid gets to live. He hangs up the phone and slams it back down on the receiver, instantly grabbing a better hold of the gun again from where he'd been holding it in one hand along with the girl's hair. Izuku's breath shudders out of him. He can do this. He can help. He's faced down so many villains in his life that this shouldn't be a problem, right? Granted, none of the doctors at the facility had guns, and they were always in control and never this panicked, but he can do this, even if all he's doing is taking the place of the girl. Holding up his hands, gloves still on because he's not about to get in trouble for illegal quirk usage, since that would definitely reflect poorly on him and his dads, Izuku gets to his feet and steps around the side of the aisle. Um, could you, oh, hey, e hey, easy... He stops when the villain spins toward him, gun pointing at Izuku, while his hand tightens in the girl's hair. It's okay. He smiles at the little girl, trying to keep his voice steady for her, before his gaze moves back up to the villain. Why don't you trade hostages? 
Me for the girl. We're both kids, right? Covers the same spectrum. I'm sure the police will still take you very seriously. He takes another step forward, but stops and settles there when the villain tenses. How old are you? The villain asks, eyes narrowing. He's not thinking fast enough to lie. I'm fifteen. The number tastes like ash on his tongue. It turns out that he hadn't been able to skip his birthday after all, but he and his dad, Sendatoshi, all came to an agreement to avoid saying his age out loud. It made him feel so, so young. Helpless and vulnerable and scared, like he never left the facility at all. It's difficult to imagine himself as a person, as a teenager with a family and a life, when he was raised as an experiment with a number for a name. The villain hesitates, posture shifting around, his wings flare out a bit behind him, and his eyes move in agitated little swings from left to right and back again. But his gun hand is steady, as you can wonder how many times this villain has shot someone. All right, get over here, then. I'm not letting her go until you're front and center. At least the villain can be bartered with. That settles Izuku a little, to think that maybe negotiations with the police will be possible. The villain doesn't want money, but he clearly wants something. I can do this. It's not like he can back out now anyway, since the gun trained on him isn't going to allow him to move away. He's either going to walk forward and trade himself for the girl, or he's going to join the other hostages on the floor. He knows exactly which scenario he prefers. God, Aizawa's definitely going to kill him, and Hizashi may even reanimate him just to kill him again. They've told him over and over that he has to put his own safety first, that he can't help people if he puts himself in situations where he's the one needing help. But right now, Izuku's fine with that. He's just going to save one little girl, make sure that she can cry into her dad's shoulder and go home when this is all over. And then he'll behave. It's all right, he says to the girl as he approaches, smiling at her even as he fights past the writhing pull of Amahaki. The uncomfortable twist of the god against his spine and the squeezing around his ribs. He swears he feels his ribs actually pressed together, which is painful and concerning and not a distraction he needs right now. Knock it off. He has no idea if Amahaki can hear him when his gloves are on, but it seems worth it to try. It feels like there are ice picks lodged in both of his palms, and he's almost positive that the marks have swapped colors under his gloves. As impossible as that should be. When Izuku's within easy grabbing range, the villain lets the little girl go, and fists his hand in Izuku's hair instead. Yanking him forward the rest of the way, Izuku winces at the pain in his scalp, anxiety shooting through him despite the adrenaline. It's worth it, though, to watch the little girl sprint back to her father and become immediately enveloped in his and her sister's embrace. He's not exactly thrilled about being so close to a gun, and he really doesn't like the edges of dark memories threatening to overwhelm him, but it's fine. He can manage this. Are we going to walk out now, or are you waiting for a return call from the police? He asks, and then belatedly wonders if maybe keeping his mouth shut would be the better option. Shut up. With how often the villain has said those two words since he had entered the store, it may as well be his catchphrase. Wisely, Izuka doesn't make that comment. Maybe all the smart decisions he makes starting now will outweigh or at least balance out the idiocy of standing up and being discovered and then willingly trading himself for the girl. He doubts it, but he can hope. The villain doesn't move from his spot, except to sway slightly in agitation. Tension bleeds over the suddenly silent door as the villain keeps an eye on both the shop door and the cluster of hostages huddled on the floor against the counter. He must be waiting for a call back, then. Izuka lets out a slow breath. He can stand here for a while. It's far preferable to being forced to walk out of the building with a gun to his head. He knows, from an ironically logical frame of mind, that he should probably be panicking right now, that he should be buried in shock and adrenaline and unable to move or even think straight, but the situation doesn't seem unmanageable, in his opinion. It's not manageable for him, God no, but that doesn't mean that they're tipped past the point of salvageable. The villain is jumpy, which is an issue, and he has a gun that he doesn't seem unwilling to use, which is another issue, but he also doesn't seem all that experienced at pulling off a crime like this, nor does he seem particularly evil in nature. So, suffice to say, Izuku has faith in this turning out fine as soon as they get a hostage negotiator on the phone. The roiling and turning of Amahaki inside of Izuku, clearly angry at not being let out, is also a welcome distraction. It's fucking painful, yeah, but it oddly helps to keep him centered, because one thing that Izuku's absolutely sure about is that he's not willing to risk the safety of any of the hostages. So his gloves are staying firmly on, and Amahaki is going to just have to deal with it. As the seconds tick by into minutes, the villain gets more agitated. The world seems to have come to a quiet standstill punctuated only by the tiny sobs of the girls and the shifting of the villain's feet. Izuku opens his mouth to say something, anything, in an attempt at calming the villain down, but the moment he draws in a breath, he feels the gun press against his neck. I said, shut up. 
Of course, that's when everything goes to hell. The door slams open in front of them, the sound echoing into the space as the frame splinters. Two figures crowd the threshold, silhouetted by a glow of police lights behind them. Izuku can't tell if they're both cops or both heroes, or maybe one of each, but the effect their appearance has on the villain is immediate. Stay back, he shouts, his hand tightening painfully in Izuku's hair as he adjusts their position to use Izuku as a shield. The villain raises the gun away from Izuku's neck, which is relieving only for a moment, because the weapon immediately settles on the group of hostages. Fuck. I'll shoot them, the villain yells, taking a step back, away from the door, and dragging Izuku with him. So stay the fuck where you are. He's panicking, his movements stiff, and his muscles tight wherever Izuku is pressed against him. Amahaki is practically screaming to be let out, thrashing against Izuku's sternum, and settling like dry ice in his fingertips. One of the figures at the door shouts something, but Izuku can't make out the words over the rapid pulse of his adrenaline finally kicking into high gear, or maybe it's the static flaring in his head. The cold muzzle of the gun is back against the side of his neck, pressed into his skin, and for the first time since the villain entered the shop, shaking in the villain's hold. When Izuku risks a glance to the side, away from what he can't help but see as threats at the door, he notes that the villain's finger is already hooked over the trigger. Something like two kilograms of pressure is the only thing separating Izuku from a bullet ripping through his throat. Not good. Not good. If he moves right now, he's probably going to get shot, and with the gun where it is, that likely means he's going to die. Not a great option. But if he doesn't do something, even if that's just an attempt at breaking away from the villain's hold on him, kicking against his shin or shoving at his arm, he's not sure that the figures in the doorway will be able to handle the severe escalation they just forced into the situation. Why hadn't they just called back? Why did they think that bursting into a shop without any fucking front windows would be a good idea? Izuku swallows. It's difficult to stand here with the knowledge that if he could just get a glove off, he would probably, maybe, be able to fix this without anyone getting hurt. But the villain is so damn tense right now. Izuku is positive. Any unauthorized movement will have really shitty consequences. He should have crushed the villain's gun when he was hidden away. He should have trusted his aim after all the time that he spent training and taking care of the situation before it could get bad. Laws on unauthorized quirk used to be damned. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a further choice in his manner of action. Something, string or rope or tape, shoots out from behind the figure on the left, and Izuka's mind hazily identifies the use of a quirk before the gun moves against his neck in one short, swooping motion, and the villain pulls the trigger on reflex. Pain blooms through Izuka immediately, just not where his freeze-framing mind would initially guess. His neck doesn't hurt right away. It feels warm and wet, with some sort of strange pressure where there shouldn't be, but it's not painful, not at first. A mild burning sensation settles in after a moment, a fraction of a moment less than a second. This is a gunshot wound, and the people at the door haven't even moved yet, and the villain's grip in his hair is still as tight as ever, and he hasn't even registered hearing the gun go off yet. And then, very suddenly, what he assumes would normally be an overwhelming amount of pain spreads bright and fast over his throat, jaw, and shoulder. But he can only assume that it hurts a lot, because... He can't really register it behind the screaming, burning, iron-hot, ice-cold, agonizing pain in his palms that is flooding his nerves. He thinks he screams, but he's not entirely sure. He can't hear anything except the crescendo of static in his head. His mouth is open, blood trickling down his throat, and out of his mouth pass his lips in a way that reminds him of the phantom sensations when Amahaki rips out of him. But he's still in his body, knows that for certain, because he's never in pain when Amahaki takes over. Time starts to move again, and the grip in his hair relaxes just enough that Izuku thinks he could pull away. He should take off one of his gloves. He should make sure the other hostages are safe. Instead, instincts kick in. Izuku doesn't trust the figures at the door to handle things, and right now he's floating in static so loud that he can't even feel how badly he's hurt. He should have acted sooner. He should have known better than to trust adults other than Aizawa and Hizashi. And a move that, when he thinks back on this later, should be too fast and coordinated for him given his gunshot wound— Izuku elbows the villain in the ribs and swings around to face him, where he's starting to double over. Izuku's hand is freezing cold when he grabs at the front of the villain's shirt, nodding his fingers into the fabric over his sternum. He knows, somehow, that Amahaki's power is leaking out of him. His gloves are still on, but something's changed. Maybe it's the blood spilling down his neck like a waterfall, maybe it's the immediate threat to Izuku that breaches the contract they formed. Don't kill him, he thinks, even as the power in his palms flares and Amahaki rattles Izuku's ribs hard enough to punch the air out of him. In a swift motion that he's practiced over and over with Aizawa and Hitoshi, Izuku hooks his foot behind the villain's knee to yank him off balance, and then he slams the villain down with the tightly restrained power of a black hole. There's more than enough force behind his clenched fist to break the villain's bones, a fact that is highlighted violently by the sharp crack that echoes past the static surrounding Izuku. 
He stumbles back immediately, hoping, hoping, hoping that the villain is just unconscious. Unconscious and not dead. He trips over his own momentum and falls roughly onto his ass. The pain and cold in his hands fades a little now that the immediate threat is away, but with that distraction gone, Izuku becomes far more aware of the fact that he was just shot in the fucking neck. Whoever the figures at the door are, they rush forward now. The first one inside crouches down in front of Izuku and starts talking into a radio, a police officer then. While the other walks over to the rest of the hostages, it churns something unpleasant in Izuku's gut that neither of them secures the villain, because it either means that they already know he's dead, or it means that they don't care if he's going to get up and start hurting people again. Izuku registers all of this, sees it, hears it, but he can't really comprehend it. Everything is fuzzy, blurry, unsteady. He tastes blood. He hears static. He feels the pressure of Amahaki between his shoulder blades, not happy, but not trying to burst out of him anymore either. Pressure against Izuka's neck yanks him out of the fog that he's been drowning in, and he really does scream this time, his body jerking as his hand clamps down on the wrist of whoever decided to touch him. The man in front of him says something, but Izuka can't make out the words above the pain and the static, and the gagging sensation of fingers pressed against the hole in his throat. He feels nauseous, but he has just enough willpower to fight the urge to vomit, not wanting to make the damage to his throat worse. And then fear clutches him, rocks him away from the pain for a moment, his eyes widen trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he can without moving his head too much. Are the others okay, the girls? How scared are they? Are they still crying? Did anyone get hurt? Don't try to talk. The police officer, gentle voice soothing, good at handling a crisis despite being bad at handling a villain, says, and the words finally punching through the static in Izuku's ears, Easy. Easy. It's okay. Everyone's all right. You're all right. Just don't move. Izuku wavers, the strength in his spine collapsing under the recession of his adrenaline, and he slumps forward. Other hands are there to catch him, holding him up with pressure on his arms and chest and shoulders. He doesn't like it, doesn't want it, but he can't fight it off. Soon enough, he's tilted backward until he's laying down. And when he rises off the ground, he distantly registers that he must be on a stretcher, the transition from vertical to horizontal is excruciatingly painful, and he almost loses consciousness but manages to hold out by closing his eyes and breathing deeply. The next time he opens his eyes, he finds himself looking up at a clear blue sky instead of the ceiling of the shop. The sound of sirens fills the air, and there's a cluster of general human noise, talking and crying and shuffling somewhere off to his right. But it's distant and not an immediate concern. "'Hey, kid. Stay still for me, all right?' Asks a voice, and Izuku's eyes work their way down from the sky and to his left, until they settle on a young woman with three short horns and beautiful orange scales. She's smiling at him, and judging by the angle of her arm, she has a hand pressed to his neck. We're going to take you to the hospital, get you feeling right as rain. Was anyone in the store a relative of yours? Blink once for no, twice for yes. He blinks once. She continues to smile at him. Didn't think so. You got someone's contact info in your wallet? He blinks twice. Good kid. She praises, then pauses for a moment to fiddle with the stretcher. He feels himself lifted up, and then he loses sight of the sky and finds himself blinking at what must be the roof of an ambulance. The woman is back in his line of sight again. Do you have any allergies to medications that I should know about? He blinks once. All right, that's very good to know. I'm going to give you something to help you sleep, then, so that the ride's not painful, okay? I'll make the phone call to your parents myself. She smiles at him again. You're going to be all right, kid. Izuku isn't fully convinced of that. He is quite... Intimate with pain, but this raw sort of burning pressure accompanied by the choking, slick, awful feeling of blood in his throat is not something he can easily move past. But the woman sticks a needle in his arm, and then counts him down from twenty. And he's unconscious, before she reaches thirteen. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 23 of Swallow the Stars. Chapter 24 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic, and as always, thank you so much for listening.